Welcome, my friends, to the Sage of Quay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking. And I'm your host, Mike Williams. We have a very special show for you tonight. I recently had the opportunity to connect and speak with Mr. Maxwell Egan. Max is an activist on behalf of all humanity and one of the most prominent critical thinkers and seekers of truth in the world today. He hosts his weekly radio show on American Freedom Voice, along with The People's Voice. He is a filmmaker, having released six films. His most recent, Transformation, has received worldwide acclaim. Max's website is thecrowhouse.com, and his YouTube channel is The Crow House. He is also leading a major initiative known as the Full Circle Project. The mission of Full Circle is to bring mankind back into their natural state of abundance. To learn more about Full Circle, please visit www.fullcirclenow.net. And my first question to Max was to ask about his journey in life and how that journey shaped who he is today. So, my friends, without further ado, Mr. Maxwell Egan. Look, uh, it's a story that I've often told, but uh, I was kind of born awake. Um, I noticed at four years old that things were all messed up. And so I just kind of struggled through childhood and as soon as I was able to do something, which ended up being uh, playing music, playing guitar, as soon as I was old enough to be able to competently play guitar and be able to think a bit clearly, I stepped out of the scholastic system and lived on the outside of society for my whole life. I, I just never participated in the whole, you know, the cesspool that is our social system. Because I could see when I was four years old that it was all messed up and there was something very, very wrong with the world. So I had, you know, I went through a lot of depression and stuff when I was a kid and uh, I had a pretty hard time with it all, but got to where I am now. I mean, it just got to a point where, you know, I was living on the outside of society for, for a good 30 years and when 9-11 happened, I thought, well, all of this research I've been doing on the side, it's now time to start speaking out about it. In fact, I probably should have been before because here is the big event we've been waiting for, so... Then I started speaking out. I put music on the back burner and I made my research, my main forte, and started speaking out. And it just naturally progressed to doing the radio shows and making the films and doing all the stuff I'm doing now. It wasn't anything I planned to do. I never planned to be a radio host or a filmmaker. And 10 years ago, if you'd asked me what I would be doing now, this is the last thing that I, I would have said. But here we are. And it's just been a natural progression for me. And I think it's an important time. I, th I think it's a very important time for people to pay attention to what's going on around them. I think we're at a real tipping point at the moment. And hence, people like you speaking out, these sort of shows are springing up everywhere now. People, once they waken up to what's actually going on, they, they, you know, it becomes a need to, to speak out. You, know, you just kind of have to do it. So, yeah, it was just a natural progression for me. And I think it's that way for most people. I think people wake up when they're due to. But uh, I was awake from a very, very early age. I can't remember a time when I wasn't awake. So 9-11 then was a key turning point for you where you said, okay, enough's enough. Yeah, you've crossed the line in the sand now. You know, we were all expecting, it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a spy novel mentality. And I was stuck in that as much as anybody is. You know, I mean, a lot of people that wake up to the way the world's run, they, they get stuck in the, the pages of the spy novel. It's like a soap opera for them, you know, this big dark hand this hidden shadow government and all this sort of stuff and people become very interested in it and they wait for the next installment and the next radio host to talk about it and the next piece of information they want to know about this terrible dark reality that's going on and it becomes kind of like an adventure story that's happening on the outside of of reality you know it's kind of the way people look at it that's kind of the way i viewed it i always knew there was this this bloodline there was this succession of people there was this whole hidden network that people around me just couldn't seem to see. I could see that most of the world events were orchestrated and it was always leading towards a direction that was very predictable. I used to tell people 30 years ago where the world was going to be in 30 years and now I run into these same people now and they go, wow, how did you know? Right. I go, well, it was obvious. It's all predictable what they're doing. And, you know, so it, it's kind of a, a real shift in the paradigm for people. But... It, once it becomes obvious to people, then, then there becomes a need to speak out. There, there really does. And when I was awake from an early age, I just thought, well, I, I can't deal with this. So I'll live on the outside of society and I'll treat it like a spy novel. But, you know, then, then they step over the line. 9-11 happens and you think, well, hang on, this is actually very, very serious. And this, this big event that we've been waiting for, this pivotal event that they're going to use to 
bring in this whole control system and this one world government. They've just done it. This is it. So the next 10 to 15 years are going to be the most pivotal time in human history. And it's time to pay more attention to this side of reality than swimming in the quagmire and just forgetting about it and living on the outside of it. Because I began to realize that if we would all just give it our attention, even if it was for one day, if we all stopped what we were doing and just gave this system our attention for one day, we could heal the whole world. We really could. You know, we've been taught not to give these things our attention, to think it's too big for us to deal with, and we have to just find a way through it, find what works for us. And that's what many of us do. That's what I did. I found what worked for me, and I stayed with it and just let the world turn to hell the way it was going because I figured there's nothing I can do about it. But then I began to realize that there's more to it than that and that I'm worth more than that and that everybody's worth more than that and that the people that are doing this uh, are just people and they're getting away with it because we've forgotten who we are. We don't think we have any power, but we do. And so that's when I began to speak out and, and try to help people wake up to themselves, really. I think that's the big solution to the whole thing is for people to remember who and what they are, remember the power that they have. Because the people that are doing this are just people, you know? Exactly. Now, Max, there's no question the awakening is happening. But in your opinion, is the awakening at a level which is slowing the matrix down or is the matrix moving along at will? Well, it's it's being orchestrated. The awakening is being orchestrated and there are certain uh, forces at work that are controlling the flow of information throughout this awakening. And there's certain mindsets that people have. You know, people are very easily programmed and they, they don't realize that they're being programmed. You know, the, the, the body is a biological computer and it receives input from all of the senses that we're aware of. And these create programs within the computer. And a lot of the whole new age mentality has uh, caused people to become uh, complacent in yes. their awakening. You know, they think, well, the world's waking up. Everybody's waking up. It's all going to change soon. But they're just sitting at home. They're sitting behind their computers and they're doing their gardens and they're waiting for the world to wake up and for everything to change. They're not applying any of their spiritual understandings to the physical world that they live in. And if they do... The system that they're dealing with, I mean, this whole system, this whole control system, it's just a meme. It's just an idea. It's, it's somebody else's idea of how reality should run. They teach us that this is what reality is all the way through school, and we grow up with this program in our heads that this is what reality is. But it's just an idea. It's just someone else's idea. You know? So you know, you, you've got to address it from that perspective. It's, it's just a meme. It's just an idea. It only exists in the ether. And yet, if we um, want to control the system, like the way it controls us, from the ether, it creates a system in our minds that we think is real, so suddenly we do what it says on all these pieces of paper that these politicians write down. They subvert actual law, replace it with their will. They get us to believe this is all real, but it's just a meme. And then they affect the physical world by this idea which exists in the ether. If we want to fight this or emancipate ourselves from this, this idea, we go, we mount legal challenges, we... we have paper battles. We write stuff on paper and we send it back to them. We get other people, lawyers, to, we pay them lots of money to write stuff on paper and send it into people. It's just this whole physical rubbish, this whole red tape thing that we do, but it's not addressing the actual root of the problem which exists in the ether. The concept that this idea is real, the concept that these public trustees have power over us, that's, that's the problem. And we, we can send in any amount of paper. We can, we can swim in the legal system as much as we want. The system created the legal system, created to protect itself, not to give us a remedy. So there's no point doing that. What we've got to realize is what the system is, is just an idea. It's an idea that's been put in place and is perpetuated by public trustees, whom we employ to manage our infrastructure for us. They get all their power from us, but we've forgotten that that's what they are. We think they're our rulers, and we've so willingly given our power away. You know, we've been trained to do this, though, through the whole nanny system. You know, they, they look after everything for you. They manage your water. They manage your food. They get this for you. They, you know, supply, you know, fix up all the series. They fix the roads. It's all good. We'll take care of you. It's all good. And we give our power away. And we want it. A lot of people want it. They want to be free, but they also want to know that there's going to be someone there to pick them up if they fall. And that's the problem. You know, people don't want to take responsibility for themselves, and they've become comfortable and they've become complacent in the awakening. 
You know, people think it's 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 all waking. People are all going to wake up. But what you've got to do is apply your spiritual understandings to the world. Realize that you're just dealing with people. It's all just people. Nobody has any authority over you. And the people that are doing all of this and creating all of this mess are, in fact, public trustees. And if we chose to put down our differences with each other and unite as one respectful community, we could change the world in a day. That's the reality of the situation. And that's what I think a lot of this is. This is it's giving us the opportunity to rediscover ourselves and rediscover the power that we've got if we choose to step into the role. But that's what we have to do, and that's what the population has to do, Max. That's the biggest hurdle, because people, they don't really understand who they are. They don't understand spirit. They don't understand that they've abdicated their sovereignty and their dominion, and they handed it over. And many people are looking for a savior. They're looking for somebody to come do the heavy lifting and do the work for them. Well, they are, but it's themselves that have got to do it. That's the thing. You know, People have to reawaken to, to the power of themselves. And that's what I've been trying to do with the radio show, is help people rediscover themselves. That's what it's all been about, you know? A lot of people join movements. They think that the movement's going to save the day. They think that you know, it's all going to be good if they just sign this form or send this money in here. But, you know, they've, they've, got to, uh, they've got to start taking responsibility for themselves. That's a big piece of it, it, getting people to be responsible and to be accountable. And the thing is, they're so indoctrinated, they're so propagandized, there's still vast amounts of people that are glued to the television, glued to that passive mind control, and just, you know, taking it in day in and day out. Well, that's the thing there are, and even the people that are awake don't really know what to do. They're awake now, and they think, well, now I'm awake what do I do with this information? And that's the things that, I, that concerns me on this show as well, that, that people receive the information and suddenly they create a schism in their mind and they suddenly step outside of society and go, oh, my God, it's all fiction. You know, I am man. My name is my calling. I am man. And they, they, they want to stand in that. They can feel the truth of it and they want to stand in it. And they, they suddenly disassociate themselves from reality, from the reality around them by doing so. It's, it's a fine line to walk, and that's something that I, I that concerns me, that, that people may do that sort of thing and have that sort of an attitude. The problem is with, with waking people up is that they wake up to reality, and it's such a shock to them. Very often they go into shock, and, and they want to step outside of reality, which means they alienate themselves from all their friends and everything that they've known. And they become an outcast. And that, that's not how to do it. I mean, I participate in society. I'm for, forced to operate within a commercial model. I'm forced to use the fiction, the legal fiction, if I want to participate in this reality. And I'm forced to participate in it because everybody else is participating in it. All I can do is speak out in a calm and eloquent way and demonstrate to people how I've managed to find my way through this reality, how I approach this reality if I'm ever required to approach it, if I'm ever required to uh, speak to people in a legal way, how I approach it. But I, I just never really enter into that sort of a situation because I, I don't really do anything wrong and, and, and I don't look for conflict. I don't want to antagonize the system I want the system to simply explain to me why it believes it has any jurisdiction over me because I'm living flesh and the people who create the legislation that they choose to inflict upon me only get their power from me. And this is basically a trust agreement. So if you're inflicting yourself upon me and you believe that this legislation is valid, well, okay, it may be, but let's first look where you get that power from because you get it from the trust agreement that I have with you. But this is a personal agreement that I have with the people in government. Actually, I don't because I didn't vote for any of them. I don't vote. I don't have anything to do with them. But the, the, this is the way it is. It's a personal thing. Everybody is in a position of a, of a three-way agreement, beneficiary, trustee, and grantor with, with the government, everybody. So it's an individual thing. People have to know how to approach it. And that's what I try to do with the shows. But I don't want people to step outside and make themselves an outcast. I want them to simply help awaken the people around them because once we all know this, then the system disappears. We don't have to fight anything. It, it just fades away because it's just an idea. It's just somebody else's idea. Well, what we've got here is a trust agreement. Like with everything we've got going on here in Australia where they're dredging the Great Barrier Reef and people are protesting, they're, they're signing petitions, they're mounting challenges with the government, they're doing all sorts of stuff. I've been saying, look, this is apparently a democratically elected uh, nation. So 
if we were to simply get everybody of the state who you know, doesn't want the, the Great Barrier Reef to be cut in half, which is pretty well everybody, if we just got these people to sign a people's mandate and deliver it to the government to say, we hereby mandate that you perform the following action, which is to stop dredging the Barrier Reef, then the government's got no choice but to comply because it's apparently a democratic country. If they fail to comply with the people's mandate, which is signed by a majority, a clear majority of the population, then they've abdicated their right to govern. They've abdicated their right to call it a democracy. It would be nothing more than a dictatorship. And it would be open declaration of dictatorship. But you've got to unite the community enough to want to do this. But people won't do it because they think, what's a people's mandate going to do? Because I have no power. I'm just a little person. They forget that they're not. We're all equal. We're all sui generis. We are all 100% as valid as each other. This includes the politicians and it includes you. They get away with what they do because we believe their fictional meme is real, but it's not. It's just words that they write down on pieces of paper. And all legislation is, is politicians subverting actual law and replacing it with their will. And what they do with it is they milk the wealth of the population. That's what government's for, really. It's to appease the population while all of the wealth of the nation is stolen from them. And they enslave them to debt so that it's the people themselves that are the ones raping the nation, the ones doing all the damage. All the coal mining, all the coal seam gas, everything we're facing, this is all people from the country who live here that are doing all this because they're enslaved to the economic model. The economic model is such a difficult program to break people out of. You know, you can get a tribal culture that lives in the jungle, lives in the forest, and they've got no idea what money is and the whole concept of money just doesn't even make sense to them. But once you go and superimpose money over their minds, suddenly they can't imagine life without it. And all it does is provide scarcity because you live in a world of abundance, but you can't access that abundance because there's this financial barrier between you and the abundance of the earth. But it's, again, it's just an idea, but it is such a difficult program to break people out of. Once you impose it over people's minds, it affects your mind like a pathogen. The economic pathogen, this is what I call it, it's like a mental pathogen and it is such a difficult program to break people out of. That's one of the biggest tasks ahead, I think, to uh, break people out of the the concept that money is real and they need this stuff. I mean, at at the rate that we're going with with this whole permanent economic growth model that we're, we're taught we have to support, we'll keep going until we turn the earth into a bare, barren rock like the moon. And the people that live here will still be looking for another planet to exploit because they still owe money to the bank, you know. They really think it's real. And they'll they'll just destroy everything to support this economic model. And and that's just numbers on a screen. It it doesn't mean anything. So it's a fascinating topic, really. Yeah, and the system is not in place to benefit humanity. And this is what I try to explain to folks whenever I get into discussion with them. I ask them to try and take a step back take a look at what's going on and take a look at your own life and notice what's in place because what's in place is a system which is anti-humanity. Well, it is, and it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because apparently we constructed it. We constructed this system in order to be able to trade with each other and to service our needs. And yet within the parameters of this system, humankind is the most expendable thing. You know, you'll discard family after family, life after life, in order to balance the books. And we're told that this is the way it has to be. It's, it's a fascinating thing. It really is. But people believe it's real, and they'll do it. I mean, people come and throw people out of their house because the bank says they have to, and they feel terrible about throwing this family out into the freezing cold. But, I, hey, I have no choice because it says on this piece of paper that I have to do it because you owe money to the bank. It's ridiculous. You know, money, money has been placed uh, way, way higher than human life. And that's a real problem. People need to think about that. Why do you have to pay to be alive to begin with? That's a question that no one ever seems to ask. You know, as soon as you're old enough to leave home, you become a debt slave. You have to exploit something or somebody or work for somebody or do something in order to collect enough paper to pay to live here. Yet you were born here. Well, what's that all about? Why don't people ask that question? Well, you can even see it, Max, in the corporate culture. People are human resources. They're assets. They're never human beings. And they are discardable and expendable. That's the interesting thing, you know, because it's all about supporting this economic model. 
and people are judged on their, their economic value and on their social standing, which is gained through economic value. You know, the more paper you can collect, the higher on the social ladder you can climb and the more important you'll be. It's ridiculous. It's, it's completely ridiculous, you know. And the whole concept of ownership, we, we judge ourselves by what we own. We judge other people by what they own, you know, by their, their economic value, by their social standing, by bigger car, bigger front door, living in a fancier suburb, got a bigger house, you know, better person. It's ridiculous. But you don't actually own any of it. And none of, you, none of it helps you discover who and what you are. It's just stuff that you accumulate to yourself because – you believe that that's who you are. You, you judge yourself by your stuff. Look what I did. I get, gathered all this stuff to me. So I'm a better person. I was successful. But who were you? What was the art of your life? What was the legacy you left behind? Just a big pile of stuff. Well, what is all this stuff, you know? It's, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't make you who you are. It doesn't make you what you are. You know, it's a fiction. But that's how we judge each other. And we, we need to collect all this stuff, otherwise we feel we might get discarded on the social ladder. We've got to climb the social ladder so that we are closer to the top of the pile because the bottom of the pile keeps falling away from under us, you know. But we don't really care about the, the people, the lower class, because, you know, they should have done something better. You know, they're not successful because they didn't get out there and have a go, which is really getting out there and exploiting other people and accumulating as much money to yourself as possible. It's ridiculous, you know, and people aren't ever able to really find themselves or express themselves or express the art of their lives because they're too busy collecting paper and, and judging themselves by all these fictional parameters that are provided for them by somebody else. It's, you know, uh, it's an interesting program. On one show, Max, I remember you saying, and I kind of chuckled to myself when you made the comment, somebody asked somebody, who are you? And they said, well, I'm a lawyer. And you had said, no, that's what you do. But who are you? Exactly. They're, right. Their whole identity is tied to the system of commerce, their job, their title, whatever it may be. But they're, they're not looking at themselves from an inward perspective. It's this outward connection that they're making, and that's yeah, how they yeah. identify themselves. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't ask what you are. I asked <laughs> who you are. What you are is, is a man of living flesh, a, a, a sentient life form inhabiting a vessel who makes his way through the commercial world by practicing uh, business as a lawyer, you know. But that's not who you are. That's what you do in order to function in this dysfunctional reality, you know. Who are you? What is your expression of life? Who are you? Have you ever asked that question? You know, what am I here for? Why was I given this vessel? What is the purpose of, the, of this experience? You know, what is the art of my life? How do I be me? to the, the best of my ability. Not be what I do, but be me. How do I express this life in the most uh, valuable way possible? Not financially valuable, but artistically valuable because the life itself is an artistic expression of creation. My life itself is art. Everybody's life is art. And people think I'm not artistic. Well, everybody's artistic because their life is art. That's the thing, you know. People have forgotten that. They, they judge themselves by what they are, what they dress like, what they own, what their partner looks like, you know. It, it's all very, very bizarre. The, the whole way human consciousness has been hijacked into this false reality which has absolutely no bearing on actual reality. And through it all, people miss out on the experience of themselves. They're, they're caught up in this fictional idea of what life should be. But really what life should be is your artistic expression of creation, how you can be yourself to your fullest potential, how you can make the world a better place by you being here and by your existence. You know, who are you? What, what, what are you here for? Are you here to be a lawyer or are you here to experience yourself? Could that be part of it? I mean, gee, that's who you are. There might be a clue there. You know, what's it all about? Why am I here? Well, perhaps you're here to experience you and see what you can do with that, you know, how you can connect with the rest of you that is also here looking at reality from different perspectives, you know. And when you really understand what the body is and where consciousness comes from, you realize that there's only actually really one of us here. It's a single consciousness. Well, it's a single consciousness in as much as all consciousness appears to come from the same source, which is in the field, in the ether around us. It's downloaded into each vessel 
because each vessel is tuned to a different frequency. That's what your DNA is. You download a frequency that you experience as Michael, but it exists in the ether. It's not local to your body. I download a frequency from that same ether that I experience as Max because this body is tuned to that frequency. So ultimately, we're coming from the same source, but we're viewing the world from completely unique perspectives. So we are completely unique to ourselves. No one will ever have the view that you have. No one will ever have the opinion that you have. There's no reason why you should expect anyone to, and there's no reason why anyone should judge anybody else for having a different view, perspective, or opinion to what they have, because they view the world from the perspective of a completely different vessel. That's the way it works, you know? And it's a, it's a bunch of parallel universes. There's about 7 billion of them right here on the Earth. Seven parallel universes, 7 billion parallel universes all overlapping with each other and experiencing each other. It's a multiverse of, of universes. Each, each expression is the center of their own universe. So why would we judge each other? Why would we view anybody as being more powerful than us? Why would we view ourselves as being anything but perfect? Because we're perfect at experiencing ourselves and perfect at being ourselves, and that's what we're here to do, obviously, because that's who we are. And that's the way people need to look at reality. I think when you do, reality just changes for you, and you you begin to see how easy it would be to fix this entire mess. It really would. And that's what I've been trying to present people with on the shows. I mean, I've said it in a million different ways, but I think it's very important that people change their perspective of who and what they are and, and who and what other people are. Because when you do, all of the barriers break down, and when the barriers fall, that's when things change. And it could be instantaneous if we all did it, you know? Yeah, the problem, though, Max, is the change is monumental. And I mean monumental from the perspective of everything you just explained is totally foreign to so many people. Yeah, that's the problem, you know. They think about the world from from the perspective of language. They don't use their right brain. They're trained not to. So you can't judge them for it. People are trained to think in language. They spell reality. They Their only concept of reality is is what the their understanding of the language will allow them to, to comprehend. Because if you don't really understand your language, how do you understand spiritual understandings, you know? And um, there are no words in English which really convey many spiritual understandings. And most people look at reality from a scientific perspective. They'll only agree with that which is scientifically proven in inverted commas because they can only think of reality from a left brain perspective. That's what they're taught to do all through school. And so the right brain is usually pretty closed down. And even if it is open a little bit, you find the corpus callosum is closed down, the, the axonial fibers which connect the left and right brain and allow them to communicate with each other. This is usually closed down in a lot of people as well. So they're unable to look at the world from a right brain perspective. But when you, when you do, it all becomes apparent and, and everything works and you can see how it works. There's even... Um, uh, there's a, a talk of a neurosurgeon, uh, I can't remember her name offhand, um, but she's a neurosurgeon. There's a link, she's, it's, uh, there's a link on my website, there's is a, a video on YouTube called My Stroke of Insight, and she's a neurosurgeon who has a stroke and loses the left side of her brain and suddenly can only experience reality from the right side of her brain. And what she finds is that she's reading all of reality holistically, everything at once, all being immersed in these senses it's like she was part of everything all of reality and her body was tiny but she was actually expansive and connected to everything in the entire universe this is what the right brain does this is how it reads reality and she gives a great account of that so it is it is true this is how it works and um, when you can think about reality this way it, it changes your perspective of everything and if we were to put down our barriers with each other stop judging each other by our social standing stop judging each other by our economic value and see each person around you as a a pure expression of creation, just all as valid as each other and all as valid as me. I'm sui generis. I have no jurisdiction over them, but they have no jurisdiction over me. We are all sui generis. We all exist with equal value, equal standing, and we're not answerable to anybody but ourselves. And if we know what good and bad is, then we don't need law. The only law we need is do no harm. That's the only law that needs to exist. You know? And if we respect each other, the world changes. And this is what I've been trying to convey. Because we could do this and we could change reality. I really believe we could. 
And I think the reason that we have so much difficulty fighting against this system is because people simply don't understand reality. They're, they're not able to look at it from both sides of their brain. And everything that I've said to you today is, if they really want to delve into it, is, is scientifically provable as well. In fact, it's scientifically proven. It's just that it doesn't get advertised very much. But it's, science has proven that your consciousness is not local to your body. It exists in the field. Your body is a biological computer. It's a very, very complex organism. And, you know, we, we can change reality by changing our perspective. And that's what I think this time is. I think that's what this big awakening is. But people just have to remember not to be complacent in the awakening. They have to remember to apply it to the world that they live in. And I think we've been given the opportunity to do that. And, and yeah, so all speed ahead, I think. Well, I think, Max, you and I are about the same age. And one of the questions I ask myself, and I'll, I'll put this out there for you, do you see the change or the shift happening within our lifetimes, or are we setting the table for future generations? It really depends on, on how long it takes for people to act, because people have to act, people have to get involved. See, this is the thing, I mean, there's so many people screaming out about the prison that's being built, but there's very, very few people that are giving people a way out. Not, see, I don't think people know the way out, even the people that are waking up. Like I was saying before, it's very very concerning sometimes that I give information to people and they only get half of it and they don't really wake up to the, the full impact of what I'm saying and the full depth of what I'm saying about what this reality is and the full depth of understanding themselves, knowing who and what they are. It's so important to do this, but to also understand the meaning of sui generis, to know that you have no jurisdiction over anybody else. You can't force your ideas on anybody. Even with the shows, the radio shows that I do, I'm not asking people to believe me. I'm simply offering my perspective because when I look at the world, I see very, very terrible things happening in this planet and I see all of them happening because people believe what public trustees write on paper is real. And to me, it, it doesn't make sense that we would allow the planet to be destroyed simply because people write stuff down on pieces of paper. It doesn't make sense to me. And I don't see how anybody of sane mind could, could see this as, as, as being sensible. And yet we have a whole swathe of people who do. Most politicians, most police officers, you can't blame these people. They're programmed into what they do very often. And they believe this is all real. And they will continue until the earth turns into the moon. That's a problem for me. And that should be a problem for everybody. It should be a concern for everybody. So I offer my perspective to people in the hope that people will rediscover themselves. But again, you can't force yourself on people. You can't suddenly step outside of society and say, I am free. I'm not going to participate anymore because you are. If you're doing that, then you're living in a fantasy because you have to participate in this reality if you're going to eat. If you're going to have a roof over your head, you have to get paper somehow. You have to do it. You don't have a choice. That's the thing. You know, if you don't, then you're staying somewhere and someone else is doing it for you and they're, they're having to work harder to cover you. It's, it's set up that way. There's nobody who can escape it, not while everybody is still locked in there. And so that's why, you know, you, you've got to still tread that line where you're participating, but you're questioning authority along the way, but you're not delivering fear to people, you're delivering empowerment to people. Because, that, like I said, there's a lot of people delivering this message to people, and they're putting them in fear, and people don't know what to do. And I think if you've got an understanding of reality, you can function sort of in system and outside the system. You know, it's kind of like I said, it's a fine line, but, you know, we're forced to do it for the time being. Nobody really has a choice unless you run off and create an alternate community and, and try to do it that way. And then you end up like Waco or something, you know, you build fences around your, your compound, you arm yourself with guns and wait for Big Brother to come and get you. And they will. Right. That's the thing. That's what's wrong with alternate communities. We've got community here. If we can change the mindset of the community around us by leading by example in what we do, while well, we're still participating, but push the envelope, always push the envelope, always question authority, always ask people why they believe they have jurisdiction over you and help the people around you understand the power of themselves. That's the most important thing everybody can do. Don't be complacent in the awakening, but don't spread fear. You know, if you're going to if you're going to talk about this stuff to people, at least offer them a path which may lead to some sort of creative discussion on a remedy. You know, you can't leave people hanging on the edge waiting for the next instalment. 
and seeing this big terrible hand and, and, and living in fear the rest of their lives that the terrible hand's going to come and get them because it will, you know. So people have got to participate. So it's very, very important that all the people in the alternate media that are delivering this type of information to people spread empowerment and spread remedy and, and help people rediscover themselves because that really is the only remedy. There's never, there's not any legal remedy. There's no legal fiction that we're going to find to deal with the legal fiction that we believe enslaves us. Why would we even look there? You know, it's fiction. That's the key word. Oh, well, and it's their system. You know? Yeah, exactly. You, you you can't use, you know, what, what's the, uh, the the expression? The master's tools will never dismantle yeah. the master's house. Yeah. They didn't build a system you know? so that we can use it. You know, yeah, it's, it's not the, there to give us remedy. The legal system isn't there to give us remedy. The remedy is in rediscovering yourself. And, you, you know, you can't rise from the masses. You need to rise with the masses. But in order for this to happen, the masses need to rediscover themselves. And that's what I've tried to do with the, with the radio shows. And that's what I've said to people. Look, I'm not trying to give you fear. And I'm not you know, telling you that what I'm saying is right. I'm just giving you my perspective. Don't believe me. Go research it for yourself. You know, but if it rings true and it resonates with you, and you know this about yourself, then do something about it. Stand in that power, you know, because, and I think it it does resonate with people because it is true. You know, we are all divine expressions of creation, and we are capable of so much, Michael. We really are. We are so locked down. So many of our highest senses are shut down. We are so disconnected because of our non-access to the right brain. And this is all stuff that I've experienced in ceremony. It's stuff I've experienced in meditation. I've had so much confirmation of this, even in the way I interact with reality. Now, if I step out of my heart space, reality falls apart around me. But when I'm in my heart space, I'm always following my dharma. I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing what I'm doing with the best of intentions and and with the goal of improving reality, then it always works. Everything always falls into place. This is how it works. You know, reality will mirror back to you what you what you put into reality with your intentions. And we can change this world if we can just learn to respect each other. And I think the understanding that I've, I've conveyed to you about what your body is and how you download a frequency and, and how you're just a, a vessel experiencing that frequency, and it's a temporary thing. It's just on loan to you. This vessel is granted to you by creation for you to come here and experience this incredible reality that we've got here. And everything that we've created, all of the whole meme that enslaves us, all of the destruction that we've done, it's all been a product of our imagination. The collective imagination of mankind has created all of this. Because even if you're going to dig a hole and, and put in a coal seam gas well, you've got to imagine it before you do it. And then you imagine it, you make it into a reality because you imagined it. This desk that I'm sitting at, someone imagined this desk. They drew a picture of it and then they built it. So this desk is a product of imagination. Everything we've created is a product of imagination. So we can imagine a completely new reality. And I believe that once you rediscover what you are and realize what your body is, it's a vessel that is on loan to you to come here and experience reality and be all that you can be in that experience and experience everybody else around you and see what their experience is because they're all the same as you because they all come from the same source. You know, it it just changes things. You begin to respect yourself. You begin to see yourself as being perfect because you are perfect at being you. No one can be you better than you. And you is what you're here to be, obviously, because that's who you are. So why would you consider yourself to be anything but perfect? And why would you judge anybody else as being imperfect? Because they're just as valid as you. They come from the same source. They just have a different vessel for the experience. Suddenly you respect yourself. Suddenly you respect them. All the barriers break down. Once it really sinks in, You know, and I can say that, and I've said that little phrase, that little whole bit there a million times to people. Mm -hmm. And people have heard it, and they go, yeah, that's interesting. But then sometimes you say it, and they just go, wow, the light goes off, and you see it in their eyes, and they go, oh, my God. And and they really view reality differently. And suddenly their whole life changes because they change the way they interact with everybody around them, whether it's a, a beggar or whether it's an elite, whether it's an authority figure whether it's their son, their daughter, their wife, their husband, it doesn't matter. It changes the way they interact with everybody. Suddenly you don't see an authority figure as a threat to you anymore. That's just a uniform. Once you understand how and you know, who and what you are, and you understand what the legal system is, if you haven't done any harm, there's usually a way, way through all of this. Because if you are sui generis and you understand your own value and you also see that in others, 
then when you have a conversation with someone who is, has you know, perceived authority, like a police officer or something, you don't attack them. You don't you know, belittle them. You don't get in that confrontational mode, but you don't cower to them and feel belittled by them either. You treat them as another human being. And that completely disarms them, usually, because corporate authority can't deal with flesh and it can't deal with respect. You know, these people expect confrontation. And if you're respectful, you know, they're usually, it completely disarms them. They're usually respectful back, I've found. You know, sometimes they're not. There's usually, you know, sometimes there's a bully there. But, um, you know, usually they are. And I think that if we can change that perspective and change the way we, we interact with other people, that's how we change the world. But it all comes down to rediscovering ourselves. That's, that's the thing. And it's a rediscovery. It's not even a discovery. I think everybody knows this. They, they just need to remember it. It is a rediscovery, Max. I agree 100%. And I think one of the keys is people have got to get back to spirit. I think they're so detached, and that's a big reason why they don't know who they are. And this is why their authority figure is the government. You know, if it's all that indoctrination that's that's been with them since the day well, they were yeah. born. Well, yeah, the, the, the government is their new parent. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that they have uh, lost their connection to spirit. And that's what this social structure does. That's what cities are for. That's what civilization is for. Disconnection from spirit, disconnection from nature. Because spirit exists in nature. But we always put little fences around nature, like a little park. We'll have a park here and we'll have a path through the park that's concrete. You walk on this, don't touch the grass, that's over there. It looks nice, but don't go and touch it. And if you do, if you walk on it, we'll give you these rubber sole shoes so you don't really connect with it. You don't want any sort of, we don't talk of any sort of electromagnetic interference going on here with the programs that we're running. You know, So we, we've disconnected ourselves from nature. That's what civilization is for. And that's why things such as the Crown Corporation, when it was formed yeah. and it went out and started polluting the world the way it has, polluting the minds of the world with the economic and, and social pathogen and the religious pathogen as well, then uh, it went out and one of the, the first things it did was go and decimate every tribal culture it could find and decimate shamanism, label all these people as witch doctors and train people to believe that anybody who doesn't follow the, the, the uh, Vatican model, the Christ model, is uh, is uh, serving the devil, you know. Uh, the big boogeyman is, is going to come and eat you if you listen to what this, this guy is saying about the plant medicines, you know. So they've instilled this mentality into people and they, they go out with the missionaries and they infect all these tribal cultures and the tribal cultures themselves then go and kill the witch doctors, you know. So it's been quite shocking the way they've done it. But they've done it because the, the, the ancient shamanistic traditions are uh, the key to unlocking your mind to help people understand what reality is and what their connection to the planet actually is. And the fact that this whole whole uh, system is a matrix, it's a, a paper-based meme, it doesn't exist, it's not real. And what we've done with our cities is when you look at them, I mean, even if you look at Earth from space and you look at the cities at night, they look like sores, you know, the, the lighting. It looks like a, an ulcerous saw on the, on the landscape. It looks like the, Europe and America and you know, all these countries are, are just covered in sores. And really that's what they are. You look at cities, they're dead. Everything in a city is dead. It, it comes from the living earth, Min minerals and materials we've gathered from the living earth. And we've built these dead structures that only have life when we go into them and give them life. But everything about our civilization is dead. It's an imitation of life. And through it, we have become very, very disconnected from actual life and from our connection to the planet. And like I said, you know, the shamanistic traditions, this was the biggest threat to the Vatican system, to the economic model, to the, the, the pathogens that infect people's mind. Like I said earlier, it's very, very difficult to break people out of the economic program. Well, a good way to do it is to take people down to South America and get them to experience some shamanistic medicines. And that, that soon breaks them out and they see the meme for what it is. And they see society for what it is. Many people go and have these experiences with the shaman with these native cultures and they, they just don't ever want to go back to civilization because they can see what it is and that's the problem man. It, it's a very very difficult thing to break people out of because people are locked into these pathogens the, the social pathogen especially and the economic pathogen you know the, these are the the most significant uh, ones that really really control people's lives and they are pathogens just the fact that people can't think outside of that economic model, that they're prepared to destroy the planet and discard people in order to balance the books, this is pathological thinking. 
And it's, it's interesting that people uh, can't see this about themselves, but of course they're trained not to see it. You know, they're trained this is what success is. That's why it's so difficult to uh, find a way out of it because you know, if people think it's real, well, what do you do? You know? You've got to try to gently nudge them awake. But again, it's, it's a difficult thing because by awakening someone, you're telling them that every single thing about their life up to that point has been a lie. It's all been uh, you know, useless and, and for nothing because they've been looking at the world from the wrong perspective or ever since birth. So very, very confrontational for people as well. Just waking people up, it's, it's very, very confrontational for them. And that's why, like with the shows that I do, I've very much attempted to always finish the shows with you know, leaning towards solutions. Because I think if you're going to supply problems to people, tell people what the problems are, you need to be providing them with a solution. And if you're not doing that, then really you're part of the problem because... You know, you're just putting them into a state of fear. You, you've got to give people hope and you've got to give people empowerment in, in the knowledge that you're giving them, you know. Max, have you ever taken a step back and thought to yourself, what makes these people so wicked? How was a psychopath created? I know you had John Lash on one of your shows. I found that discussion fascinating. In fact, I read his book, Not in His Image. And he talked about mind parasites, the archons and stuff like that. Not that I want to drag it down that rabbit hole, but... It's just very curious to me, how do these people come to think the way they think, destroying the planet, looking at most of humanity as a slave race? It's just mind-boggling to me. Well, it's a, it's a soul born with no empathy. That's, that's what a psychopath is, basically. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think that psychopaths are consciously evil. I just think that they do what they do. And also, really, if, if, you, look at the, uh, if you look at the whole human system, yeah, what we've got here is it's about the experience. It's about self-discovery. It's about discovering yourself and, and doing something with the time. But if you were to just come here and have this experience and everything was just perfect and everything you wanted to do just worked, then you'd never have the choice to grow. So what would the experience be for? How would reality ever understand itself? How would the mind of God, which essentially I believe all creation is, whatever you perceive God to be, if you can imagine you know, the mind of the creator split into billions and billions of different frequencies, experiencing all of reality from every perspective of everything, from every plant, every tree, every animal, every human being, everything. You know? and, and you've got all of the stuff that we're doing damage to, which is all the plants and the planet and all of this stuff. You've got this there. How would it experience what that pain is to have empathy for that pain? And how would it ever experience the pain of what the psychopaths do to human form as well? And how would it ever experience the choice? I mean, you've got to have the choice. You've got to have the choice to go wrong. It's said that 3% of the world are born psychopathic. They're born without empathy. What, what is that for? You know, and it's said that 8% of the world are born and they can't be programmed. They just, they just can't be part of the system. It just doesn't work for them. So what's all that for? It's, it's got to have, you've got to have that balance, you see. So without that choice, what would the experience be for? You've got to have that choice. So otherwise, you, you don't grow. Consciousness would never have the means of discovering itself. God would never find out how God became God, if you will. Perhaps you could look at it that way. But whatever God is, whatever this mind is, because if we all come from a collective consciousness, it appears that we do because your consciousness is not local to your body. It's downloaded from the field. The field around you is not empty. It's, it's full of energy. I mean, everything radiates. The fact that you can see something means it's radiating energy. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's radiating light. No energy is lost. Where's the light radiating into? Where is it radiating into? It's radiating into the field. So the field isn't empty. It's full. It's full of energy. And that's where consciousness comes from. Consciousness creates everything. It's all part of a collective mind, you know. This is even shown through, through quantum physics. I mean, Max Planck said that, that, that reality is a, is a result of a conscious mind. Einstein said it. Mainstream science even says this. All the mystics say it. All the yogis and the Sufis, everybody says it. It's all a collective mind. You know, you get these religions that come along and say, oh, listen to all that, it's mumbo-jumbo. You're here to do what you're told. Because God has this list of 10 things that he doesn't want you to do. And if you do, he's going to torture you forever. <laughs> so don't listen to any of that. Don't listen to any of that. Because you're here to do these, everything that it says on these lists. And if you don't, you're going to go to hell. So that's what your life is about. Forget all the other stuff. That's the devil. 
It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But, you know, reality is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And we have the opportunity to experience all of this. And, and that's what I think it's all about. It's this rediscovery. That's what's happening right now, you know. Yeah, there's a rediscovery and awakening that's underway. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, when I step outside my circle of influence and I survey my surroundings, the reality of where many people are is um, very sobering. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. There is, but they're pushing us to do the work. You know, they're pushing us to do it. I mean, here in Australia, the new laws they've brought in with the Vlad legislation. Yeah. I've, I've taken a stance against the Australian Attorney General. Now, I'm going to push it. Just keep pushing it. I saw his letter back and, to you. Uh, it was typical. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, 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 by the way, yeah, guilty until proven innocent. That's basically what he's saying. And uh, it's not acceptable. I mean, it's not acceptable. I'd like to point out to people that uh, to Queensland Police, because it says in the Vlad legislation that if you belong to an organisation and people in that organisation have broken the law, you know, then uh, you're part of that organisation, so you're part of an outlaw organisation, blah, 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 you know, and so you can be just jailed, you know, and you've got to prove that the organisation that you're in was not engaged in illegal activity. Well, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of uh, Queensland police officers in a town called Mackay were are charged with and convicted, I believe, with uh, rape and deprivation of liberty. So therefore, the Queensland Police Department is an organisation which has got members which break the law. And so therefore, any police that are seen in groups of two or more should be arrested as, an, as belonging to an association that breaks the law and the owner should be on these police to prove that the police do not break the law because we can prove they do because these two guys have just been charged with rape and deprivation of liberty. So how are they going to escape that? Why doesn't this law apply to them? Why does it apply to everybody else? And this applies to any organisation that the government names as being of interest, anybody who breaks the law. And all you've got to do to break the law, according to them, is to, you know, what's, what do these people do? Okay, they're sitting on the grass on Sundays. Okay, let's write on this piece of paper that you're not allowed to sit on the grass on Sundays. We'll put a rubber stamp on it. Suddenly these people are in, engaged in illegal activity and they, be, they can be jailed as an outlaw group because we said that what they're doing is against the law. You know, this, this legislation is so nebulous and when you understand that laws are created, uh, uh, crime is created by, by the government, it's by them, breaking the, by, by them creating laws, that's how crime is created, they can turn anything into a crime. An interesting thing that it said in the letter that he, he wrote to me is that uh, any person who can prove, I'll read it for you as a quote, it says, a person charged under the new laws has the opportunity to prove that the organisation to which they are connected is not an organisation that invo- engages in criminal activity. Any person who can prove this has a complete defense to the criminal offenses created or aggravated by this legislation. This is an open admission that the criminal offenses have been created by the legislation. Crime is created by government. I've been telling people this on the show for so long that every time a new law is created, a new crime is created. And he's just openly said that in his letter to me. It's almost like a a confession the letter that he sent me. He basically said, we created the crime by creating the legislation and what the legislation is about is guilty until proven innocent. That's basically what he said and he signed it off. So it's great. It's a nice piece of uh, ammunition I can use in any future legal battles that may ensue. But you see what's happening there, Max. They're at a point now where they're just shoving it in people's faces because I don't believe that they believe that Anything is going to happen to them. These are their laws. It's there to protect them. But I think in their minds, they're believing they could do whatever it is they want to do because we're seeing the same thing here in the States. All these laws, it's all intended to criminalize existence. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The thing is that they can do anything they want to do and they will get away with it if the people of Queensland don't stand up and pay attention. Exactly. I mean, I can do what I'm doing. I can lead by example in what I'm doing. But if these people don't stand with me, I can't speak for them. Because I'm sui generis, and so are they. I have no jurisdiction over them. If they want these laws in, I, I can't do anything about that. I have no jurisdiction over Jared Blay, but I have to inform him that he has no jurisdiction over me. Nobody has any jurisdiction over me. I'm only answerable to my creator and myself, and I know what good and bad is. I don't need a nanny. I don't need someone to tell me what I can and cannot do because I do not do harm in any of my actions. That's the way it is. You know, but I can't stand for the state. All I can do is lead by example and point out the fact to the people that they're losing their right to trial. 
and that this state is being turned into a police state, and that because they believe all of this stuff these guys write down on pieces of paper, all this fiction is real, then they're going to allow this state to be turned into an open-cut mine, and a lot of them are going to end up in jail. That's what's going to happen. That's where we're headed. And if, if they're not prepared to pay attention and, and stand up for their own freedoms, well, there's, there's really a lot I can do about it. All I can do is point out the obvious to them and lead by example by standing up myself and hope that uh, many of them stand up with me. If they don't, well, there's nothing I can do for them. That's the unfortunate reality. And it's sad because they're my brothers and sisters and I don't want to see them come to harm. But if, if they're not prepared to be aware of themselves, well, that's the experience they've chosen. They're all sui generis individuals, the same as me. And I, I can't speak for anybody except myself. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Do you get hassled, Max, when you take up these types of issues, or do they just leave you alone? They leave me alone. They leave you alone. Okay. I mean, they, they, they um, repress everything I say. They delete my subscribers all the time. I've got people who have to subscribe to my channel on a daily basis. They get deleted all the time. They, I've seen them drop my video count view. I saw them drop 3,000 views off one video in one hour. So I've got no idea what my actual count is. Um, they restrict my website on, in some countries. They, they do everything they can to make sure that it limits the flow of information. But they don't just try to shut me down because I think that would create too much attention to what I'm saying. They don't come after me legally because everything I say I can prove. I mean, when I talk about empowerment and the stuff that I do on the shows, I think they find it very scary because what I'm saying is common sense. I think everybody knows this inside. When I tell you that you're not your name, you're living flesh and, and the beauty of yourself and the power of yourself and the fact that no one has authority over you, that this is all a meme. I mean, I think the powers of be know this and I think the information scares the hell out of them. And if they were to come and take me out, uh, it, would, it would create a, they'd, they'd martyr me. A lot of people would want to know what I've been saying. And I think that if enough of the world actually listened to the message that I've got posted on the website and the stuff that I've said in the shows, I think if enough people heard it, it would change the world. I really believe in it. I absolutely do. And that's why I, I, I deliver the message, because it needs to be delivered. I do it for free because I want people to know that I don't do it for money. You know, people make contributions occasionally, just enough for me to barely get by. But, I mean, barely. I mean, I live in a, I live in a shed with no hot water. I live in someone's garage. So, you know, it's not like I'm living high on the hog or anything like that. So, you know, I scrape by... But I think it's an important message, and I don't think they, they can take me out. I think once you reach a certain level, I don't think they can touch you. You know, I'm not scared of these people at all. I think that's a big part of it. You know, if you're in fear of them, they can get to you, but I'm not in any fear of these people at all whatsoever. They can't hurt me. They might be able to damage the vessel that I'm experiencing, that I'm inhabiting, but they can't hurt me. And if they were to hurt me, well, I think the message would go viral. It would be the biggest mistake they ever made. So, yeah, I, I just do what I do because I, I think it needs to be done. The, the most hassle I get are from conspiracy theorists who send me death threats because they buy into disinformationists who, who say that I'm, I'm a, somebody else wearing a prosthetic face and <laughs> that I, I'm an Illuminati, uh, hand, I've got a handler, and, you know, all sorts. I mean, people do what they can to discredit you because the information scares them. And I think self-responsibility scares people as well, as does any um, suggestion of unity. I think a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of people in the alternative research community have got a vested interest in maintaining the fight. They get good incomes from it and you know, they like um, keeping people in fear, keeping people stuck down rabbit holes. And they're not really interested in solutions. They're interested in the whole you know, alternate rock star community sort of thing. You know? Yeah, they have the celebrity. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, there's a higher harmonic than that. Yeah. I think it's, it's about empowering the people and it is about finding solutions. And I think that's what we need to be, we need to be focusing on. I think the solutions come from, from self-empowerment. So that's what I've focused on anyway for, for six, seven years. I don't think anybody's more powerful than anybody else. I don't think I'm particularly clever. I don't think I want to lead anybody. I think people should lead themselves. And I think the reason they don't is because they don't know themselves. They don't understand how reality works. And so I offer them my perspective because ultimately that's all I've got. That's all anybody's got. You're a big voice yeah. out there, Max. I know you probably don't like to hear that because... You don't want to hear the leader thing, but I got to tell you, you're a very, very big voice out there because you do speak from the heart, and it is common sense that you're speaking. That's the thing. You well, know? it is, you know. Yeah. It is, and and if I'm a big voice, well, I just hope I'm a I'm, I'm an empowering voice. You I are. I hope that 
a lot of people are getting the message and I hope it works to empower them. And they realize that I'm not really a big voice, I'm just someone who's prepared to speak. And I think that all I'm doing is, is helping them remember something they already know. So I don't really deserve much credit for that. I think the awakening comes from the individual. Once they rediscover themselves, it, it's just like a light bulb goes off. Really, it's like you wake up from this this sleep, like you've been asleep in this bed of jelly that's been covered in con- you know, or, or cobwebs, and you, you wake up and pull all this murk and cobwebs and darkness off you and pull the clouds away, and the sun shines through, and you just go, oh, my God, you know? What have I been swimming in all this time? And I think it's something that people already know. It's already there in their hearts. I'm just helping give them a little nudge. But I think it's really important for people to understand that it's, it's just my perspective and that that's all anybody can give you. When you listen to the alternative research community, you listen to people talking about all of these things and all of the ways they found through the system, they're giving you their perspective based on what information that they've had. And you need to take what resonates with you and remember not to forget your own perspective. Just just change the way you view things. Look at things through different eyes. But most importantly, first you've got to understand who and what you are. Really look into what I was talking about, about the fact that your body is a biological computer. I mean, this is all in science, you know, electromagnetic impulse. Everything that you are, it's all electromagnetic. The whole experience is electromagnetic. This is, this is profound once you understand who and what you are and what the people around you are. Then the matrix almost becomes a visible right at that point. So I think that's an important step. And you've got to understand, you know, the law of mirroring, the law of, of emotion, what emotional state you're in. I mean, I find all of this information incredibly empowering. I don't find any of the negative stuff that I report on, any of the control get or any of it. I don't find it fearful. I don't find it disempowering. I find all of the information empowering. All information is light. And um, it, we've just, we've forgotten how to process light. You know, it's, it's a mistaken processing of light that, that, that we have, you know. We're scared of of much light. We're scared of knowledge, knowledge of of our environment. We're scared of knowledge of the system, but it's just light. It's how you process it that's that's the issue. Are you going to move into fear or are you going to find it empowering? I don't don't find any of it fearful. The more knowledge I can gain about how reality works, the more knowledge I can gain about this control grid, the more empowered I become, the more I know how powerful my own body and my own consciousness is and how easy it would be to change the world. And so, yeah, I think people, people need to adjust their perspective and really be careful when they're assimilating this information. Don't get stuck into the fear porn. You know, and people get addicted to the fear porn. They like to be in fear. It's like a, you know, watching a horror movie for them or something. And, but once they, they go too far, because you know, it all becomes obvious, then they see they go, wow, why didn't I see this control grid before? So they start telling people about it, and no one wants to listen. So they go into complete fear. Oh, my God, there's this police state being built. What am I going to do? And they just lock themselves away, and they get stuck in the pages of the spy novel. They need to you know, really move beyond that and see that it's all actually empowering and that the, the path to remedy is actually very, very simple. All you have to do is apply your spiritual understanding to the physical world in which you live. And change the way you view yourself. Change the way you interact with other people, and the world changes very, very quickly. I agree, Max. You know, grasping on to that empowerment, who you are, the fear dissipates. I mean, I could speak to that myself. This is something that I've realized over time, you know, because I used to be stuck in that apparatus, in that matrix, living the life of fear. And then when I had that awakening, you were talking about being in that bed and you have the cobwebs. I mean, I remember when I woke up, I remember thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me. What have I been doing for X number of years? And then when I woke up, everything shifted and changed. So my take to people when I speak to them is if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. You just go through the processes. You know, people usually go through into absolute amazement to start with. You know, amazement. Why didn't I see it before? And then they they go into fear because people around them won't wake up, unfortunately. But they don't move to the third stage, which is empowerment. And I think it's important that we do that. So good on you for doing the shows and, and good on you for helping get the message out. Thank you, Max. And thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts and perspectives. And I would love to reconnect and have another discussion with you sometime in the near future. My pleasure, Michael. Anytime you want me to come on, happy to come on and have a chat. All right, Max. Well, thank you very much, my friend. Okay, bye-bye. And that concludes our discussion with Max Egan. I would once again like to thank everyone for listening, and thank you for your support in visiting the blog, sageofquay.com. Please check out my music and album, Leaving Dystopia, at laboroflovemusic.com. 
And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.